My story starts in the great Southland, Terra Australis, otherwise known as Australia. I was born and raised in South Australia, and my favorite spot in South Australia was right here in Counter Bay, a beautiful name for a beautiful spot, and it has a lot of history. In fact, in 1802, a famous English captain, Matthew Flinders, met a famous French captain, Nicolas Baudin, both circumnavigating Australia in the opposite direction, and the meeting was entirely accidental. But wait a moment, 1802, England and France are at war. So how could this be a peaceful meeting? It turned out that both captains had scientific papers, which en enabled them to travel across each other's territory in a peaceful manner. So in Counter Bay, where they met each other for the first time, accidentally, unplanned, they were able to meet each other on each other's ships and transfer maps and have a decent conversation. So this is a beautiful spot to me near my home. But it has other significance because in 1912, which is just over 100 years ago, looking southwards, we had this phenomenal southern ocean, 3,000 miles wide. Antarctica over the horizon, 10 million square miles of ice, two miles thick on average. Now, that dynamic system, the combination of Antarctica and Southern Ocean, it meant something. It meant something. It's so big and so powerful. It, it drove all the weather in Australia, for example. And in fact, I became a meteorologist in Australia while I did my science degree just to understand the effect of this system. And in 1972, NASA, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration of the United States, published this beautiful, beautiful picture of our planet known as the Blue Marble. Perhaps the most published and referred to image of any image in the printing world. December 1972, 30,000 miles up in space, an astronaut, Harrison Smith, the only geologist to have flown in space so far, took this image from the spaceship using a Hasselblad film camera, regular, not a digital camera, a regular camera. And look how beautiful this image is. The Earth, seamless, borderless, fully integrated. And look how powerful the storm systems are over the Southern Ocean and Antarctica. This is the middle of summer in the Southern Hemisphere, the middle of summer, and look how strong the weather patterns are. So I knew that this system in the South had a gigantic influence on our entire global system but I was still to find out exactly how. Now today, we have supplemented that early work 40 years later with hundreds of satellites in space, Earth observation satellites, high performance computing, and on the ground, all kinds of radar and LIDAR, light-based radar. And we have data coming in now from all directions on our planet, about our planet. We have so much data, we can't use it all. We're not using it all. Perhaps we're only using 20% of this data so far. And the other problem is the data is specialized. So we do have a problem in ingesting so much data. We have a problem in analyzing it, and we have a problem connecting it across all the, the subsystems which are being measured. And that's, this is, exactly what leads me to the idea, the big idea that I'd like to talk about. It's an ambitious idea, but the idea is that we build 
an organization that can integrate horizontally all this data from the hard sciences, the solid earth, the oceans, the poles, the atmosphere on one hand, and even the social sciences that drive our social economics on the other hand, and the whole biosphere in between. So we have so much specialized data, we have so much specialized science, that it's time to integrate it horizontally and understand what the entire planet is doing, the whole planet, and have a holistic view of the planet, not just a series of specialized opinions. Now, I think the vertical specialized data and vision will always be there. I don't think that will ever go away. But I'm just saying it's time to supplement and complement that with a full horizontal integrated viewpoint. And the public, I think, are asking for it. I think our society is saying, okay, specialization is fine, but give me the whole picture. Help me understand how these specializations talk to each other and are interconnected and coupled. And that's the mission of the International Center for Earth Simulation that we have recently put in place the integration of all the sciences, hard and soft, the integration of the earth sciences with the biological sciences and the social economic sciences. Is it important? Well, I think it is, because we're getting some wake-up calls, a number of wake-up calls that are very, very serious. And for example, this is Japan. March 11, 2011, the giant magnitude 9.0 earthquake, followed by the tsunami 30 minutes later, destroyed 400,000 structures in Japan, including in Fukushima, three nuclear reactors. Over 19,000 people lost their lives. We're still trying to recover from this. The estimated cost of this event is 300 billion so far. Before it's all over, maybe 10 years from now, it's a trillion dollar event. And this is the coupling of nature with society. And, and this is not, we, we just haven't focused on this coupling, this horizontal effect, what you may say is the cascading domino effect, a, a multiple synchronous collapse horizontally across all our systems. This is a science we don't have, and this is a science we need to put in place. And this is the science that the International Center for Earth Simulation is all about. In this particular event, the nuclear problem contaminated the land, the ocean, the atmosphere, the food chain. It caused the prime minister at the time of Japan to be pretty much taken out of his job, Prime Minister Khan, and it caused the nationalization of the world's largest utility company, TEPCO, Tokyo Electric Power Company. And it also caused, a few weeks later, in Europe, Switzerland and Germany, to decommit from a nuclear energy strategy. So it had a global consequence. And it turns out now, when we do our homework, there are over 70 nuclear plants currently installed in tsunami vulnerable areas. So this is the coupling between uh, Earth and it, the way it operates and our social economic activities. It's time to bring it all together. It's time to integrate it. Our cities today are becoming mega cities. Half the population of the planet is right now living in a city, and these cities are expanding. Our population will jump from 7 billion to 10 billion by the end of the century. And a lot of that will be in our cities, but they're vulnerable, they're fragile. And what we're doing is building cities on earth earthquake zones, fault lines, and in the, near, near the sea, the coastline, and in river floodplains. So all of this makes our cities vulnerable. And we will hear 
uh, later on this afternoon from uh, Dixon de Pommier, we'll hear some very good ideas about how to make our cities more sustainable and resilient. But more on that later. What I'm saying is that this is just an example. Take Europe, for example, the Icelandic ash cloud. What a disruption that was for the European economy. Uh, take the floods, uh, whether they're UK floods or large-scale floods like in Pakistan or in Bangkok recently or Queensland, Australia. These are enormously disruptive natural events and partly driven by climate change with a warming atmosphere that holds more water and can deliver more surprises with respect to extreme weather. Now, how do we come to grips with this and our social economic systems? It's, it's, it's a horizontal science we have to develop. True, here in the UK, the UK Met Office in Exeter is outstanding. It's a world-class operation. And take European Centre for Medium Range Weather Forecasting in Reading. It's another world-class operation. And together they tried to bring weather and climate together because it is one integrated continuum across weather to climate. But that's not enough. There's much more than that happening on our planet. Now, I have to say that one of our activities uh, happens to be, if I can uh, get a transfer here, and we did, is to look at, for example, this importance of the ocean. And here we have a three-dimensional visualization of what's actually happening in this ocean of ours. And you can see the water here being transferred uh, from the south to the north, the Gulf Stream emptying out into Europe, keeping Europe five degrees warmer than it otherwise would be, losing the heat, coming back south as the water drops down. As it gets colder and denser, it goes to the bottom and comes back to the south underneath the north going uh, warmer current and rejoins with the Southern Ocean, couples back to the Southern Ocean. And the Southern Ocean circulates around Antarctica nonstop and brings all of this water back to a single stream. And then it fragments again this time you will see it spin off in a loop in the Indian Ocean. And then it will come back to the Southern Ocean once more. And that visualization is, again, a way of expressing the science and the understanding. And here is my home country once more. Well, we got more to understand about this planet. Everything that happens interior to the planet is important as well. And I have to say, interior to the sun is important as well. And so what we have here is a simple example of we've got to bring our knowledge up in these two areas. The interior of the planet has all the convection currents that create a magnetosphere that protects our planet from the sun, which is turbulent in its own way. And the two are coupled. And the complexity of the interaction between the sun and the earth is space weather. The space weather drives much of our local weather as well. And this is a complex area that we have to integrate in all of our modeling. And we actually have to reach out to the solar system. It's beyond just the earth and the sun. Oh, we have our moon, of course. The moon is very critical to the stability of all of our systems on the Earth. But we have neighbors, as you know, Mars, we're there right now with robotic instruments. But uh, just a little bit further on, we have Jupiter. Jupiter is 300 times the size of the Earth in mass, and it has 67 moons, can you imagine? It influences us. We have to bring all that into our equations. And, and we haven't yet done it. So it's time to integrate. If only we knew what we actually already know, but we just haven't integrated it. So you may ask, all right, how exactly are we going to do this? And where exactly are we going to do this? So I think 
that it's time to put together what I would call a public-private partnership. Because our governments actually have vast amount of expertise. They have most of the instrumentation that generates the data. But you know, they don't have the money. Our governments, whether it's the UK, Europe, United States, Japan, all these governments, they have no money. The money is sitting on the sidelines in the hands of corporations and wealthy individuals. We have to draw out these funds in the way of philanthropy to drive projects of this nature, I believe, at this point in time. We can't just wait around and expect the United Nations or any group of governments to fund this kind of activity. And on the other hand, we can't just wait around for another crisis to happen. And, you know, the crisis could be a simple crisis like the pollution in Beijing. It's enormous. Or the British Petroleum oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico. Very, very close to being a global disaster. We can't wait around for those things anymore. Uh, we've got to get on and bring those knowledges together and create a unified knowledge system that helps us predict and foretell what these developments could do to answer the what-if questions that are coming to us now faster and faster as our population gets more and more dense. So this universe of ours, I mean, it's a tough problem to figure it all out. Uh, I don't mean to say we have all the answers, but we have to begin the pathway to integration. I think we should do it in Switzerland, a neutral country, uh, a country where there's a good example of CERN uh, as a global science project, which has been very successful. Unfortunately, it took 50 years to build CERN. We don't have 50 years to build the Center for Earth Simulation. I think we have five years, most. So, bottom line, we must get off here and start a not-for-profit, for public good venture to integrate our knowledge and all the discussion we heard about earth science and citizen science, we can bring it all together in that approach and it's time to do it now. The time is right. We have the components, we just haven't had the willpower to integrate what we should have integrated. And I believe this big idea, if I could ask for your support, get behind it, take a look at the website, we're ready to go. Thank you.